Okay, so what I'd like to do is trace a little bit of that history, also go back over some of the points that Bob made with special reference toward, again, the area that I focus on, which um, uh, Justice Rosenblatt pointed out is really the origins of urban planning, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. So I wanna focus on that creation of the Civic Center in the first couple of decades of the century. And what I'll do is also try to put it in the larger national context of really what is a Civic Center, right? It wasn't just New York building that Civic Center, but it was something that was common across all major American cities in these years. And uh, it was tied closely to ideas about political reform, citizenship, uh, public order, um, urban renewal, these kinds of things. So I wanna kind of put it in that larger context and look at some places outside of New York. So with that being said, uh, let's see if I'm right, okay. So uh, looks like Bob and I are looking at some of the same pictures and maps, which is great. Uh, and I'll come back to these as well. Um, I would point here, uh, I think most people don't know that there is a Manhattan Civic Center, right? If you drive along the FDR uh, freeway, you see this sign. But those of you who are involved in the legal uh, world go to Foley Square and know these buildings, perhaps intimately. Uh, but most average people in the city probably don't even know that there is something called the New York Civic Center. Um, so again, I, I'd like to speak a little bit about what that is. Again, you see a period image there from uh, 1934 showing, as Bob explained, at the center there on the upper uh, upper right, the uh, 60 Center, uh, 40 Center, the federal building just closer to us in the background there, the state building, and all the way to the left, the, um, uh, the, the Board of Health. As, as Bob said. Um, so the, uh, as, as Bob pointed out, the origins of this idea of essentially uh, grouping together municipal, uh, at first really municipal and some state buildings originates in the very beginning of the 20th century with the appointment, uh, well, with really I'd say the consolidation of the, the boroughs together in 1898 into the greater New York City and a kind of growth in bureaucratic, uh, needs for bureaucratic offices, space, uh, and a kind of sense that the older buildings were no longer serving um, the, the purposes that they were intended for. At this time, around 1900, the city was spending a tremendous amount of money renting office space in the area, and so the idea of consolidating, uh, building, and owning uh, municipal real estate to house not just courthouses, but uh, all kinds of municipal functions was, uh, was something that the city was pursuing. And again, it wasn't just New York, but this idea of grouping administrative functions together in, in so-called civic centers is something that almost every major American city was looking at at this time. And New York played a leadership role, but not it wasn't alone in this case. So I just show two images there of, and I think Charles will talk about this more, uh, the idea of, of clearing uh, City Hall Park uh, of all but the original uh, City Hall building and, and kind of restoring it to a uh, early 18th century uh, landscape was uh, something that was part of the idea of creating um, a recognizable civic precinct at the center of the city, but also it was about preserving uh, the identity and character of New York City. It was very critical to the development of the beginnings of the historic preservation movement as we know it today. I think Charles will talk about a little bit of that relative to the work of, again, George McEnany uh, as borough president, among other things, was, was active in that. Um, uh, again, you see on the bottom there the image uh, from the sun that clearly the, fo the, the, the postcard that Bob showed us was lifted from. Uh, okay, so you see a lot of circulation and recirculation of these images. Uh, the promotional images really for the idea of, of the Civic Center. Um, Again, I'll run through a little quickly uh, some of the proposals uh, without getting too deeply into them uh, for redeveloping, again, a kind of civic center, a grouping of municipal buildings around City Hall Park. You see on the left there a plan promoted by uh, the uh, American Institute of Architects to build a series of large buildings sort of behind City Hall, outside of City Park, along the north side of Chambers Street. You see a kind of elevation view above and a plan below um, that would have created, uh, really amplified in a way, the presence of the, the smaller city hall sitting in the park uh, with the open space of the landscape around it. Um, and then a later, um, the 1930s era idea of a kind of civic skyscraper that you could see on the right would have overarched even the municipal building. Um, and uh, so, they, and these are not the only ones, there were a number of proposals at this time to essentially rebuild civic um, offices ar around city hall park, uh, almost in every case, in t involving clearing away the older encroaching buildings that Bob talked about in favor of new um, kind of groupings of buildings. And again, it's important to remember that it was the uh, the courthouse commission, a group of justices who were appointed in 1903, as Bob said, who were the ones making decisions about commissions, uh, contracts, building, um, and uh, in fact, essentially 
ended up deciding really the Civic Center by choosing in 1912, as Bob said, to locate um, the City Hall, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, the County Courthouse, right? And now the Supreme Court, 60th Center Street, they are on Foley Square. Um, so show you here again, this is an image I think Bob showed you on the, on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, um, that shows the migration again of the idea away from City Hall Park and up to the north, um, northeast area that later becomes Foley Square. And I just, uh, to put this in context, on the right I'm showing you a map of land values in Lower Manhattan 1903, and this suggests perhaps some of the logic of why we see this movement to the north and the east. Not only, as Bob said, did it bridge a gap between the existing uh, government buildings that were there north of City Hall already, and not only did it serve to, in a way, as Bob, I think, um, suggested, uh, that it was a way of replacing the older slum of, of Five Points, renewing that district of, of older buildings with a, a presence of government authority, right, of, of legal buildings, of public municipal buildings overtaking and being built on top of what had been a rather notorious uh, immigrant district, right? So that certainly was part of, I say, the urban renewal of the Foley Square area that's created there. But the other thing that drives it, of course, is real estate value, right? Essentially, the, the, the spaces uh, along Chamber Street, uh, adjacent to Broadway, that was expensive real estate. As you can see from this map, um, I mean, I'm sure it won't surprise you to see the clustering of very high values along Wall Street, but what might surprise you, as I think Bob also perhaps intimated, is that look at the very high values there along Park Row, uh, that diagonal street just adjacent to City Hall Park, where you see values $200 a foot in 1903, which rival some of the values there along um, Wall Street area. So the fact is the real estate there was quite expensive. Uh, commercial interests were, um, uh, eager to develop and build there and, and uh, rather than municipal interests. So I think uh, the decision to move to the north and the east to essentially cheaper real estate also drove the development of Foley Square at the site that we see there, uh, that we see today. Uh, so we might think of it in economic terms as well. Here are just two, again, images, the one on the right, quite provocative uh, from the New York Times, the idea, uh, again, these are both circulating 1912, 1913, around the moment that the final decision is made about the site of Foley Square. Um, and you can see on the, on the left, Again, provocative New York Times um, headline, Chinatown to be wiped out. Uh, and there's a bit of, quite a bit of sort of purple prose in that article about the menace of Chinatown and the, again, um, the things I was saying before about the way that the redevelopment of the area with, uh, with, with institutions of justice, of authority, was a way of displacing uh, other uses, right? Uh, daily uses of immigrant and working class uh, groups that were living in the, the buildings, working in the buildings in that area. So it was part of a process of uh, re developing a kind of civic precinct and displacing, right, other uses in that area. Um, and although Chinatown was not wiped out, of course, uh, the, the, and, and the New York Times may have, uh, editors there may have uh, hoped for, aspired to something different than transpired there, but nonetheless, um, what you see on the, on the right then is the final, uh, essentially, site plan of the Board of Estimate, again, led by George McEnany. Charles will tell us more about it. But that was essentially the, the, the plan that was decided upon in terms of the condemnation. So, and, and I think Charles will talk more about this too, but proceeding then, from 1912, you have a long uh, process of condemnation, eminent domain, um, each of them individual hearings, right, uh, to establish value, uh, to expropriate all of that property, a great number of maybe, if you put it together, maybe as many as six or eight blocks of real estate that are um, demolished to make way for the Foley Square that we know today. And I'll, I'll come back to this with some maps a little bit later. Um, so as, as, again, as Bob has said, Guy Lowell, Boston architect, rather surprising victor in the competition. You can see, I'm sorry, a very blurry image there on the, on the right, but uh, a great number of the leading kind of New York terms, uh, firms, York and Sawyer, Van Buur, uh, H. Van Buren, McGonagall, McKinmead and White, Carrer and Hastings, they lose out uh, to this uh, guy from Boston, Guy Lowell, um, and in particular his rather um, uh, unusual proposal for a round uh, building that was immediately compared to the, the Roman Colosseum, and I'll come back to that as well. Um, on the bottom there, you see uh, the bust of Lowell that is there in 60 Center Street. Um, and uh, as you go through the security apparatus there, I encourage you to look to the right and admire uh, uh, Lowell's visage there. Um, you see on the left here, two images of the winning proposal of Lowell, which Bob showed you a little bit. It was a unusual, I'd say almost unique, a word I don't use often, but a unique, uh, 
uh, architectural form of a round uh, building. Again, the Times immediately compared it to the Colosseum. Others uh, uh, compared it to a wheel of cheese. Uh, it was rather parodied, uh, but it was, as Bob showed, it was designed to fit, sit right in the middle of what we call Foley Square over Center Street, streetcars running underneath it, uh, a massive building, as you said, 700 feet in diameter. And um, on the left, I'm uh, also plugging uh, my own work. Uh, the, we have forthcoming, uh, I have a, 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 a chapter in a forthcoming book uh, from Fordham University Press, Press called Classical New York, uh, to be coming out this fall, in which I have an essay that looks very closely at that building, the round building, and its relationship in particular to uh, its, its kind of classical form, its uh, appropriation of Greek and Roman ideals of kind of monumental buildings. So um, I, I won't go too deeply into it, except to say that, and again, for those of you who maybe have worked in that building, or those of you that have worked in courthouses, one of the things that Lowell um, said, one of his arguments for the round form, was that it would create, in his mind, a very efficient separation of uses within the courthouse in terms of the program. He believed that different uh, courtrooms uh, had different functions and could be allocated efficiently around the uh, circumference here. That certainly uh, that it would create, by having an interior light court, you could have courtrooms lit from both sides, which in the era before electric lighting would have been uh, advantageous, of course, in terms of light and air and circulation. Uh, he also um, argued, uh, and again, as someone who doesn't use courtrooms uh, may not be able to assess this as well as you can, but he argued that uh, the great, uh, again, um, diversity of uses, roving rooms, waiting rooms, uh, jury rooms, these kinds of things could be handled uh, quite uh, better in a round building that would create this kind of separation of rooms, better than a, um, uh, an undifferentiated mass of a rectilinear kind of box-like building that would more typically fit into a gridiron plan. Uh, so again, I, I don't want to go too deeply into this here, except to, to say that there was a kind of logic behind this round form, aside from, of course, the classical intimation of a kind of Colosseum-like monumental pile. Um, and uh, you see in the next image, which is, okay, uh, again, uh, the postcard that Bob showed, uh, which, um, aside from in the foreground, the kind of open park space, I call your attention in the, uh, the left rear background on both top and bottom, you see an image of this Lowell's courthouse. On the bottom, you actually see a, uh, a suggestion of the round building. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's called the proposed Civic Center. And on the top, uh, you see a kind of square-like building, which is called the actual Civic Center. So it's a quite, and uh, I find it quite fascinating as an art historian that a postcard was published as the Civic Center. And of course, it is uh, nothing, uh, of course, that, that is complete fiction. Uh, the, the Tweed Courthouse was never torn down at the time of this mailing, 1913. The, the, the post office was still there at the tip, so it's quite an interesting um, fictitious document in, in any case. On the left, um, again, a newspaper, and I show this from the San Francisco call, so this idea of a kind of national publicity around this project uh, and a kind of artist conception of what the round building might have looked like anchoring a kind of civic precinct there again north of City Hall. Um, okay, and then uh, we see, uh, again, the, the hexagonal building. I uh, won't go deeply into it here, um, except to point out, again, on this lower left image that, um, that Bob also showed, the kind of, for, the, the kind of classical features there, the, the forest of colonnades uh, that seem to envelop and enclose the space of, the, uh, of Foley Square. This, and this is what I want to come into now, is the uh, kind of stylistic uh, development of a kind of monumental or sometimes called Beaux-Arts uh, uh, architectural style to represent these public institutions within the, the civic space of, of this, um, the, this precinct. And again, this comes out of um, uh, architectural history of, uh, of the late 19th, early 20th century that I, that I want to put in a larger national context. Uh, again, just some images that show the way that the circulation that I just described or the round uh, building is, um, is adapted to the, the hexagonal building uh, that you may know today. Um, and Okay, so where does this come from? Where does this idea of, of the civic center come from uh, in the national context? So Bob did mention this, the, uh, the, the court of honor, the central um, uh, feature of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago of 1893, uh, the World's Fair of 1893, which was, it's hard to overstate the kind of influence of this uh, on American culture at the time. Uh, 1890s, of course, represented a time of American uh, achievement and superior, beginnings of sort of American 
Western uh, dominance, right, in economic, uh, industrial uh, production and, and, and wealth, but also military and political um, uh, developments. Uh, you're only a few years away, for example, from the Spanish-American War, when the United States becomes, for the first time, not a colony, but a colonial uh, power, right, an em empire uh, over places like Cuba, uh, the Philippines. Uh, so there certainly is a sense in the 1890s of this growing American presence. And the idea that, um, that, that America might be essentially a kind of new empire, a new Rome, um, was certainly uh, part of the idea of these civic centers and this, um, th this repeated use of the classical idiom. And it comes very much from this World's Columbian Exposition. So what we're looking at here in the top two images is um, this coordinated complex of buildings uh, that surrounded the central lagoon. This is just off of Lake Michigan, right, a kind of water, a watery lagoon there at the center of, uh, of the fair. Uh, and at the head of it, you see the domed, again, very Roman, heavy, monumental, columned, porticoed building that was the administration building. Um, and then the other buildings, they might look like all the work of a single design or a single architect, but in fact, they're the works of six or seven or maybe eight of the leading American architects, mostly East Coast, New York, and Boston trained, um, or working in New York and Boston, most of them trained in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which was the leading uh, international uh, school of kind of academic architecture in which uh, flowed, out of which flowed um, designs for places like the, the city of Paris, the city of Rome, these unified uh, sculptural uh, architectural spaces of, of European cities. And with the rise in the late 19th century of mobility, right, of elites, of wealthy tourists being able to go by steam across the Atlantic and see and take in London, Paris, and, and, and Rome, et cetera, uh, there was a sense that there was a need to rebuild American cities in this image, in the image of a kind of architecturally coordinated institutional space uh, that could represent this new era in American, again, military and economic, especially uh, superiority. Uh, so this was taken, um, as I say, very influential, not only on architects, obviously, but also on politicians, on decision makers, on patrons throughout the United States and, and throughout United States cities. And, and what I would say is that this idea of the, the coordinated complex of Roman Renaissance, um, again, imperial sort of architecture uh, also can be seen in the development of another key uh, factor, I'd say, that develops into the idea of the civic center, which is the development, the redevelopment of the Washington Mall in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, so the lead, um, the director of works at the World's Columbian Exposition was a Chicago architect called Daniel Burnham, uh, perhaps known to some of you as the, uh, his firm is, the, is responsible for the Flatiron Building here in New York, for example. Uh, but Burnham was a, a Chicago architect who kind of oversees this, this common complex of coordinated work by these, these architects building this court of honor in 1893. Based on the uh, his success there, he was uh, appointed by um, uh, Senator McMillan of Illinois to lead a commission in 1901 to replan the Washington Mall um, and essentially to restore the original plan. So in the upper left, you see the plan, the original plan of Washington, D.C., 1791. Obviously, Bob mentioned the, the brief uh, moment of the federal capital here in New York in the late 1780s, early 1790s, and then Philadelphia, and then eventually settling on Washington, D.C. by 1791. So this plan, uh, I'm sure known to many of you, features, of course, at its center that open space of an axial mall, but then these radiating uh, axes of streets that connect uh, among them 13 open squares at their intersections, of course, the 13 uh, representing the original colonies. And then in particular at the head there, um, we see the, uh, in a way this can be read as a political diagram, right? Uh, so we can see sort of at the head there, uh, the, the place of the United States Capitol, right? And then we see here just north of the mall, the place of the White House, right? And then here, though it wasn't built here, this plaza here was designed to be the place of the Supreme Court. So it becomes a political diagram of the separation of the powers in the United States Constitution, right? The executive, the, um, uh, the, the legislative, and the judicial, each having their place within this spatial system, um, and all anchored by this axis of a wide uh, space of, of the mall. This was the original plan of DC, uh, and in fact, it's perhaps interesting to note that L'Enfant, uh, a lieutenant in, gener in Washington's army, had been, his father had been an architect, uh, or I think a landscape designer who had worked at Versailles uh, under Louis XIV in, Paris, in, in France. So new, uh, certainly this, this mode of a kind of Baroque monumental urban planning um, and brings it to the design of Washington, D.C. Now in the intervening years, as, the, as Washington's 
DC had developed, as we see on the upper, upper right there, uh, the mall had been redeveloped in a more picturesque way. We could see the winding, irregular sort of pathways uh, that invaded, if you will, uh, the space of the mall, very much based on the romantic mid-19th century ideal of uh, Central Park, right, of, of, um, of the kind of informal landscape, the English garden tradition in a way. Um, and indeed, it was Andrew Jackson Downing, the Newburgh uh, landscape designer, Newburgh, New York landscape designer, who designed this sort of irregular system. And you can also see there that by the late 19th century, uh, the railroad had invaded into the space of the mall and disrupted it. So the idea of this Macmillan Commission plan of 1901 is to restore the clear axial organization of the mall back to its original idea. And now it's Burnham uh, from Chicago who essentially employs this idea, right, of the court of honor, of a very um, a central landscape feature here in Chicago, a lagoon, here in DC, a lawn, um, and then surround it with, with uh, impressive monumental uh, governmental buildings to uh, contain and define a kind of civic space of the landscape. So I would say this formula of the, the, the court of honor at, at Chicago, of the mall in DC then becomes the idea that we see imported into numerous American cities under the guise of the civic center, which again becomes the idea of a centralized place of municipal administration uh, defining a, a kind of central precinct in American cities. And you see several examples here. And I should say that if you read into um, the individual rep municipal reports of American cities between say 1900 and 1920, uh, you can, uh, other scholars have identified at least 70 uh, reports that suggest this idea of building a kind of complex of municipal buildings called a civic center at their center uh, of the city. And some of the most famous ones are, as we see on the upper right there, the Cleveland uh, so-called group plan or civic center of 1903. This was also authored by Burnham, along with New York architects um, Arnold Brunner and, um, um, and, and John Mervyn Carrere of the New York Public Library. And here again, I think you can clearly see the idea of a central kind of a mall, right, landscaped, and then it's surrounded by uh, complexes of rather, um, we might say, identical but perhaps harmonious or uh, conforming buildings um, with uh, classical features, uh, heavy kind of porticos, uh, uniform cornices, uh, pedimented entries, a number of these sorts of features. Um, and then on the lower lower left for, for St. Louis, a very similar sort of system. And in San Francisco um, on the lower right, the uh, so I'd say uh, the one in Cleveland is was probably the first uh, pr Civic Center to be proposed in this mode, following up on the DC and, and, and Chicago plans. Uh, it is about half built. If you go there, uh, several of the buildings in the rear, uh, the, the federal building, the post office are there. The eastern wing of it is there with a, a, a Board of Education building and a, a public a municipal theater. Uh, court, uh, county courthouse and a city hall are there. The, the, about half of it was not built and is just um, kind of commercial buildings there. But it was about half realized and that central mall is there in Cleveland, if you know it. Um, um, on the bottom, the San Francisco Civic Center, as you can see from this 1945 photograph, was almost completely realized around the, the, the number uh, three there is the domed city hall. Um, and then around it, you see a municipal auditorium, uh, a state building, public library, uh, behind a, a war memorial opera house, um, and uh, another civic building. So again, the idea there of, of uh, of defining a kind of civic park or an open landscape um, th that is bordered by these uh, th these municipal buildings uh, with this kind of classical features was the the parti or the idea here of, of defining a kind of civic precinct at the heart of, of American cities. Um, Burnham himself goes on in 1909 to propose, as some of you may know, a plan, uh, a municipal plan for Chicago, the heart of which is again a civic center. Uh, and you can see there um, uh, these three examples of the, the overall map of the kind of regional scope of the plan of Chicago on the uh, on the left with at its very center and radiating out from uh, the, the, at its very center this kind of triangular civic center with these boulevards and avenues radiating out from it not unlike Washington DC um, on the bottom you see a kind of elevation view of this dominating uh, city hall building surrounded again by this now rather familiar trope of these classicizing buildings that in their uniformity uh, define the central space of the of a kind of plaza there a public plaza um, and so um, if uh, we look at, uh, if I connect this then to ideas about political reform uh, and uh, this uh, kind of stylistic idea of this monumental institutional identity, uh, we might look here at a quote, uh, I think this is one of my last slides here, um, of Arnold Brunner, who's a New York architect who again had worked with uh, Burnham and Carrere in 
in Cleveland to develop that first Civic Center plan. And here's Burnham looking back about 15 years later on what they had done in Cleveland. You can see the plan of the Cleveland uh, project uh, at the top and a postcard view of the San Francisco project below. And I won't read the whole thing out to you, but essentially you can see that um, Burnham is saying here, or sorry, um, um, uh, Brunner is arguing that um, there, in the first paragraph, right, there's a class of commercial interests in the city, fierce competition, struggle for supremacy. Buildings quarrel with one another to out overtop and outdo uh, each other. Uh, there's this sense in, uh, again, for Americans who had been to Rome and to, uh, to Paris, there's a sense of the um, uh, a sense of the uncoordinated irregularity of the American city. And so um, Brunner finishes in the last paragraph by saying uh, the civic center is where the city speaks to us, where it asserts itself, here the streets meet and agree to submit to regulation, right, to control, to collective uh, identity. Um, they resolve themselves with some regular form. The buildings stop swearing at each other. Competition is forgotten. Individuals are no longer rivals. They are all citizens. So again, this idea of the civic center was meant in the end to promote this idea of a collective, not just physical identity, but a place of, of, of popular participation in government, in justice, in, um, in, in creating a, a space in the daily life of the city that could uh, promote, again, in this kind of classicizing idiom, a sense of citizenship, of, of, of participation of everyone in a kind of public sphere. Now, I think it remains to be seen whether these places succeeded in providing this, right? I, I'm not saying that in any way these were entirely successful. Again, I think very few people know about fully Square as a civic center, very few people in their daily life go there. Uh, but I think the idealism there was, was part of the what, what this is all about. And then I'll just finish by showing that um, this idea quickly came into uh, the currency of American planning. You see on the upper left a, uh, a plate from a uh, high school civics text, uh, which shows sort of the proper way to plan a civic precinct. And again, we see the formula of a, a mall-like open space surrounded by and defined by the public buildings in these kind of classical styles. Again, very much related to the Chicago image on the bottom or on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, um, a page from a planning text of the, of the 30s that shows, again, these kind of iconic civic projects, all of which, again, conform to this sort of uh, form. So uh, that leaves us, again, with maybe a little bit of a deeper understanding of what the Civic Center was about in terms of its physical form, the, the architectural style, and uh, the idealism of a kind of uh, political reform that might be seen there. And so let me just take one more minute uh, and just show, run through uh, five uh, maps uh, of the Foley Square area that show you maybe graphically some of the changes. So here we have a map of uh, G.W. Bromley, Atlas, City of New York. I'm going to run through five different editions uh, across from 1911 to 1955 in which you can trace the changes in the Foley Square area that we're looking at. So 1911, we can see, as Bob pointed out, uh, densely built, right, uh, commercial and uh, some residential tenement buildings in that uh, triangular area, uh, right, just north of City Hall Park. Uh, you see the um, on the municipal building there at the bottom. Okay, next, 1916, again, a fictitious, amazingly, I think, atlas that shows the building that wasn't built as if it were built, right? The, build, the round building was not built, but we have a sense from this map that, that it was, okay. But you get a sense of, again, the, the demolition, the condemnation that was necessary to clear those blocks away to build this, uh, to open this space. We can see a more uh, accurate view in 1923 of the courthouse site unbuilt, right? Again, the, uh, the intervention of World War I, uh, problems of budget, of, of uh, foundations, subsidence, led to the redesign. So here we see throughout World War I into the early 20s, the open space uh, that, that remained there uh, across uh, nearly a decade, then we see the, uh, the, rect, uh, the, the hexagonal building, 1925, but yet the space that we know now with the, um, uh, the, the state building and the Board of Health not yet built, uh, and certainly the, uh, um, the federal building not either. Uh, by 1930, we see that the state building is there, but not yet, uh, the, the federal building not yet completed to the south, the Board of Health not there yet. And also, again, we don't have time to dwell on these, but if you look on the left, um, it's interesting to see what happens with those lots that eventually become the federal buildings on the west side. Uh, they are parking lots, gas stations right up through uh, the 1950s here, as we see in 1955, um, the um, uh, kind of parking lot gas station that will become the site of the, uh, the federal buildings on the west side. So I'll leave you with that uh, image of the 1955 uh, Bromley map of the area which shows uh, the fully square Civic Center almost as we know it today. So thanks very much. Appreciate it.